Good evening. Welcome to Tuesday Tales for Storytelling with Puck. We will, as always, start with a story. Every day she would write. Her fingers tapped, tapped, tapped on her keyboard, which used to be a typewriter, which used to be a pen, which was once just a quill, until those fingers hurt so much that she could write no more. Ideas would flow, confusion would turn into compulsion. Letters would become words, words, paragraphs, would become pages, would become books, would become joy to all who read. One day, she was asked, she was asked a question at a book signing to which she could only answer, no. She had always seen other writers in the room say, yes. Feeling a little left out, she bought herself a cube. Every evening, just before her fingers were too tired to write anymore, she would scroll to be continued on her cube. It became her muse. Every morning, she would look at it before starting again. Every day, she would see less and less space on the cube. And when she could finally find no more space at all, she declared that she could write no more. Picking up the cube and raising it high above her head, she knew she could finally answer yes to the question. Do you ever have writer's block? Welcome everybody. <laughs> the first question of the night. Do you <laughs> ever have writer's block? <laughs> Feel free to unmute yourselves. Of course. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> Anybody else? <laughs> I, I can't think of anything else to say. <laughs> <laughs> the first time for everything. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> and does anyone have the solution for uh, getting rid of writer's block? I think keep you're practicing, not it, practicing, you're practicing is the key to everything. Once you stop, you can't, um, you can't exercise anything anymore. So I think just keep going, I guess. Hmm. That makes a lot of sense. Anybody else have any tips or tricks that they use to, maybe if we, instead of saying get ri getting rid of my writer's block to reinforce their creativity. I never know exactly what direction to go in because I'm often writing for an audience I've never met hmm. um, or writing a chapter for a book for an audience I've never met. And because my mind is such a mess of sort of jacuzzi of s s soups and chowders and cappuccino all blended together, I never know. So I just start, I just start. Uh, and then I leave it and then I come back to it tomorrow and think, gosh, that was dreadful. Or, yes, that would work, but this audience might want something completely different. So I go off in a different direction. So it's a bit of a, it's like walking around a city without a map in the early days till you go, that's the direction of travel. Uh, I, I wouldn't use the word, I don't use the word writer's block. I use the word confused about where I'm heading. <laughs> that's when you find the best things though when you wander around the city without a map that's when you find the hid hidden treasures oh exactly that hidden treasures yes 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 and not you know the old photographic thing of look up and, and and don't go not necessarily go where everybody else is going and often in, in my world travels i've hired people uh, by that i mean i've often hired, I've often hired students uh, from if I'm going to a university to I, I want a student just to take me on a walk uh, and I was in St. Petersburg and I, I get a mate of mine from Tajikistan knew a guy from the Caribbean who knew a girl in St. Petersburg who was a tour guide with an MBA in international trade and Mandarin 
And she said, what do you want to see? I said, take me to your favorite cafe. I want to go to a restaurant where there are no European tourists. I don't want to understand the menu and I want to eat stuff made by the local chef for local people, that sort of thing. So getting off the beaten track helps me, whatever it is, soak up reality as opposed to McDonald's written in Cyrillic script. <laughs> so wandering, I wander around. Probably not. Probably not a good system. Oh, I think it's a great system. <laughs> Personally, it, it works for me. Yeah, I, I, I'm with you. I feel like um, it's the best way to it's the best way to discover and. It gives you, uh, I know it's an overused word these days, but it's genuinely inspirational, I think, when you wander without a map, when you wander and you don't try and find anything, or if you try and purposely go off the beaten track, because it, it's those little gems, those little places where you discover moments that connect to you in a way that you didn't ever expect, because you couldn't predict them, because you never knew you were going to be there in the first place. Um, our friend Andrew, uh, who uh, is, is, is here today, um, often talks about, um, and I'm going to let him continue this actually, but often talks about serendipity and serendipitous moments. And I think they can happen in the most, well, of course, in the most unexpected of places, but sometimes allowing yourself to be free helps those serendipitous moments. You could almost, you could almost not force them, but um, give them a pathway. What do you think, Andrew? No, I, I, I agree. I think one of the things, I think I've said this before, Stefano, one of the things that I've missed during the pandemic and the lockdown has been those little unexpected encounters with people when I'm on my travels. Um, and Alistair spoke beautifully about his travels there and all those little moments where you just observe things and have little accidental interactions with people. And I, I love that. I love that. I mean, since the pandemic, I found a partner through that particular experience that was a serendipitous moment on a, on a walking wow. her dogs hey hey T tell us more and now we're, <laughs> and now we're in each other's lives how about that <laughs> fantastic that's the that's the a, a, a wonderful moment of a, a romantic story we actually had a romantic story today which we might read later um from uh, from one of our storytelling with contributors um but uh you've uh, you, you've you've guided us down that path there and <laughs> <laughs> unexpected collisions are so much more interesting yeah. than you know, following the agenda yeah Absolutely. Absolutely. I think also when you've had an experience, which which has been wonderful, that's come about in an unplanned sense, when you try and replicate it, so it, it never works the second time around if you try and recreate it. So all these things, I think, have a unique element to them because they're unplanned. And that's the that's the beauty of them. Yeah, it's true. I, I don't know about you guys, and I, I, I'm not like this in every location, but there's some locations I've been to on my travels quite a while ago that I'm scared to ever go back to for the reason that you just mentioned, Andrew, um, because you can't recreate the moments. And also you have a perfect image of the place mm. and you're slightly worried that it might completely change, but that could be a good thing. It could change for the better and there'll be whole new experiences. But sometimes there's that little bit of, um, I guess that fear of fear of difference <laughs> or something that you knew and you loved that you explored before yeah. maybe changing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think the the whole key, the whole purpose is to go in without expectations, right? Because if you start mm -hmm. having expectations, then all the wonder, all the magic just fades. So <laughs> this is the yeah. I think you that's should... very true. I think if I think we're talking a lot about travel. <laughs> of the places that are the standout places for me of, in, that I've gone to in my travels. They're the places that I knew nothing about, hadn't Googled it. Most other people told me to avoid it because it was either boring or dangerous. So I had very, very low expectations and they were always the best places that I traveled to. Whereas, you know, going to the Parises of the world to be honest, you can only be a little bit disappointed because it's not like in the movies. 
<laughs> Maybe that's just me. <laughs> it's funny that you say that because um, uh, also during my travels, the places that people always had the highest expectations about, it was the, actually the, the places that I didn't quite like <laughs> because they're so touristic. <laughs> and I would often go to uh, countryside and places that no one has ever been to. I was always into art and art galleries and museums and the groups I uh, often used to travel with uh, yeah they kind of only liked to you know go to the touristic traps and then take a photo in front of I don't monument and then that was it <laughs> I think I may have mentioned this story before one of our live uh, uh, sessions but um, I remember uh, one, of, one of our first trips together in, in Italy we went to, to, to Florence and we went up to, I can't remember the, the, the name of it, but there's a, a, a viewing point where you can see the old bridge, the Ponte Vecchio, um, and you can see a lot of Florence from that particular um, viewing point. And we were we were sitting there watching over this beautiful scenery, and I think it was watching the sunset. And it's a very touristy thing to do, to be honest. Um, it, it, there's lots of um, uh, lots of people doing exactly the same thing, but. There are certain things, there's a reason they're a tourist trap because they're incredible. So we didn't mind <laughs> seeing, the, <laughs> seeing the sunset. But I remember seeing um, somebody coming up, not looking at all at the view, turning around back to the view, putting the um, camera out in front of them, taking a photo and then just walking away without looking once. <laughs> What's the point? <laughs> I don't mind if that's how people want to spend their time. That's how people want to spend their time. But it wasn't for me. That's for sure. <laughs> Classic line of a tourist who says, darling, come over here and look at the view. And she says, ah, I'll, I'll see it on the video of when we get home. <laughs> 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 but I was in Times Square. I went, went I took the family to for, for something. I was in Times Square, came out of the hotel in the morning, went to breakfast somewhere nearby, and it was, I don't know, 60 or 80 dollars for not very much. And I thought, this is ridiculous to line up and be treated so badly. So the next morning I said, come on, family, we're not doing that. Well, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Let's get out the guidebook. No, no, no. Let's wander, wander. Let's go down this street. And we wandered down. And then let's go down this alleyway. Look, look at all those vans. They're all post office vans. And they were all parked outside a little cafe and the, it was filled it was let's call it a greasy spoon it was better than that but it was filled with guys all sitting around tables and their postal bags were lying on the tables and my children said dad is this safe i said i bet you the new york <coughs> men are just the safest people ever so in we stroll and they look at us go who are these people and the puerto rican lady behind the counter said hey y'all good morning what do you want and and we got a pile of stuff. And of course, the postman wanted to know where you're from. And we wanted to know how many letters they delivered. And uh, we stuffed ourselves for 12 bucks or something, you know. But it was the conversation in this place where tourists would never go because it wasn't on the main drag. Mm. Mm. And, in the, and off the main drag is where we find where the creatives, poets, business people, um, uh, possibly even medical engineers haha, find things that you don't that, that everybody's finding on the main drag. so you go somewhere else to find it the Mendelevs of this world yeah yeah absolutely yeah I remember I, I was in Jamaica once I, I had to because I used to I come from the golf industry I don't know whether you know that Alistair I, I used to be in the golf industry and I ran a golf tournament over there oh, I didn't know and that but la great. laughingly called work to run ah, a golf <laughs> and um, we ended up in uh, Montego Bay very, very late of the evening and spent far too long in a bar. And one of us ordered a taxi. And this was like two o'clock in the morning. And we'd, we'd had a few by then. And a car pulled up and I just opened the back door and got in. And the guy said, what are you doing, man? And it wasn't the taxi driver. It was just some <laughs> random guy who, who happened to have stopped near where I was standing. So that, that was an interesting conversation that hmm. didn't go very far because I very quickly exited the car. But it was one of those little <laughs> situations where you never quite know what's going to happen, particularly when you've, um, you've overindulged yeah. uh, and perhaps your inhibitions are, uh, are, are reduced. 
Mm. How funny. There's a guy in Belfast just on golf. He designs the strap lines for Ping. Ah. And I think Ping, are they a Japanese company? No, Ping's an American company. Ping's an American. Yeah. Because anytime I'm in his office, he said, this are next year's Ping golf clubs. Now, you know, and we'll have to say, you know, go further or don't go into the water, Rory, or whatever, <laughs> whatever the line is. Yeah, yeah. All right, interesting. Golf, golf and stuff. No, well, I, I mean, I, I have one story stored up in case we get to that point, but I shall, I shall let others have a say first. Oh, we will definitely get to that point. <laughs> we, we, will, we will be, uh, we will be uh, sharing uh, stories. Actually, you've, you, you do this, you do this quite a lot. Andrew. You lead, you lead, um, lead me well to uh, to explaining to um, anybody who is watching uh, why we are here tonight. So, um, storytelling with Puck, two thousand and twenty-two. We have had people sharing their stories um, across social media, and the Zoom evenings are all about extending that to uh, having a conversation and a chat and. And sharing even more stories um, and that's uh, what hopefully you've uh, enjoyed already for the first um, uh, I don't know how long 10-15 minutes of the conversation um, and we will continue with that mode but as Andrew just mentioned uh, some of the stories are, are written down and, uh, and, and, and ready to go um, so if Andrew or if anybody else would like to volunteer themselves to, uh, to share a story we are very very open to listening. <laughs> First, I would like to, um, to say something about uh, your example, uh, Stefano, about the, the person that wasn't looking at the scenery. <laughs> I, actually oh, managed, yes. <laughs> yeah, I actually managed to, uh, to visit a museum in like 30 minutes. It's not my proudest moment, but I really wanted to see that museum. But I was in Prague and I was uh, on a tight schedule. And um, I really wanted to see the clocks museum because uh, I don't know, clocks are fascinating to me. <laughs> and it was a huge, a huge museum. And I only arrived like 30 minutes before their closing time. Um, they even let me in, uh, let me go in without paying for my ticket because I said, no, wow. please, it's very important. I really want to, <laughs> I really want to see it. And all I did was take pictures you know <laughs> I went from room to room I looked around I took pictures I said okay uh, I will look at them later but right now I just want to breeze through everything <laughs> but it was very funny you know <laughs> and I think they laughed see this they laughed there's a, a perfect lot. there's a perfect example you know of, uh, of, of me maybe missing something uh, maybe maybe the people who turned around and took a photo of the view and then ran away had a very, very good reason for doing it, just like you did when you were in the museum. So. <laughs> I love the irony of going to a clock museum and not having much time to look at yeah. clock. I, I love that. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, it also re reminds me of the it joke of somebody who, who took a picture of a big clock in somewhere like Prague. And someone said, why, why are you taking a picture of that clock? And they said, well, it's just in case someone asks me later on what the time is. Are you winding me up, Andrew? Oh, <laughs> very good. Yes, very good. I think it's time for a story before the puns get even worse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, otherwise we'll uh, only be right twice a day. Anyway, who's got the next story? <laughs> very good. Well, I can read my story. The, the one that I submitted on, I think, Sunday, Sunday evening <laughs> after our first uh, Zoom call. It was a, a very enjoyable story to read, but I'm sure we're going to enjoy it even more here. Yeah, because it uh, it kind of ties in, you know, uh, with the the discussions that the discussion that you had uh, between the what's the difference between uh, fiction and nonfiction, and if uh, people prefer one or the other. Well, actually, I uh, I like using symbols. You know, I let's say I use uh, I write nonfiction stories most of the times, but of course they are based on the real world. So. <laughs> It's, uh, I like to give, uh, you know, my characters uh, certain traits that uh, someone can relate to, you know, and try to, I don't know, uh, instill some lessons uh, through their, uh, you know, their stories. So, okay, well, let me just find my story. 
So it's called Have You Met Yourself? You'll hear my cat on the background. <laughs> from, from, for has, some reason, he has your cat it. met? Has your cat met itself? <laughs> <laughs> for some reason, he likes it when I speak English. I don't know why, and he he comes to <laughs> to also share his thoughts on the matter. So, yeah. Funny. Okay, so here goes. Every day, she's up there smoking her cigarettes looking down on everything from her ivory tower with her perfect hair and flawless makeup. Nothing ever too much, nothing too shiny or too striking, all in perfect balance, in exquisite harmony. Not a wrinkle in her clothes, not a single strand out of place. Still, today something seems off. We've been going back and forth on a business deal for several weeks now, But today, she finally conceded to some of the more sensitive terms. I was prepared for a tough negotiation, but somehow all the discussions started to feel like stalling tactics. So I was both surprised and relieved when she gave the green light. So here we are now on her terrace. She calls it her special place from where she can observe the world without the world observing her back. She has her precious Mont Blanc in her hand, and I am waiting for her to sign the documents. The seconds that go by seem like forever, and it's like I'm staring at a frozen image. Have you met yourself? She says, interrupting my train of thoughts. She caught me off guard, so I let out a puzzled yet firm, excuse me? Have you met yourself? You know, when you look in the mirror, and acknowledge that the person staring back can only be yourself. Well, who else would it be? I made a snarky remark, which I (laughs) regretted as soon as it left my lips. A complete stranger that looks like you, sounds like you, dresses in your clothes, eats your food and runs your business. An utter fraud, an imposter, nothing but an empty on the inside lookalike, a shell. What would you think about this? For the first time, I thought she was actually flesh and blood, as opposed to the ice queen I pegged her out to be. However, what I said was, looks to me like it would be a bit of a conundrum there, but may I ask, where is this all coming from? I don't know who I am anymore, she whispers, talking to herself almost, forgetting I was even there. Did I make a mistake in choosing this, these things? I feel I lost the me I knew somewhere along the way. This ideal facade, this picture-perfect life, every step carefully planned and executed. I'm so tired of keeping up appearances. Fighting for every little thing exhausts me. There's no sense of purpose anymore. I fear I've wasted all this time. I need something else for myself. I forgot what being happy truly feels like. I don't want the old story anymore. The pen still hasn't touched the paper and she's miles away. As I gaze around the place, my eyes fall upon a massive mirror inside her apartment. I can't help wondering from whom, uh, wondering whom I would see staring back through the looking glass. Bravo! Thank you. I love I love that expression when the the, the pen touching the paper. It's a very sort sort of a tactile image. It's, it's beautiful, and mostly it's fingers touching keyboards these days. So it's nice to to remember that it, there, there was once a thing called a pen, and there was once a thing called paper. <laughs> yeah, that, that's true. <laughs> Signing a document is such a, a moment, mm. whatever that document is. There are many significant documents in our lives and the mark we leave, making your mark and leaving a mark on a piece of paper. I bought a fountain pen many years ago. My wife said, for your significant birthday, I want you to go next time you're in London. And I went to the pen shop in um, the Burlington Arcade to be met by a very... Uh, interesting Russian lady and I had gone in to buy a particular pen 
And she pr produced it. And I said, oh, gosh, that's the center of gravity is not where I thought it would be. It's heavier than I thought it would be. She said, why don't you try this one? And so she brought out a, a variety, Faber-Castell, Mont Blanc, um, Caran d'Ache. And then she said to me, you cannot buy a fountain pen standing up, sir. <laughs> you have to sit down at this grand old wooden desk covered in Egyptian paper heavy cotton and whatever it's made from. And you must write and dip the nib and write some a significant sentence with each of the pens. And then she said, you might even close your eyes and, and just feel it. So I bought the pen, a pen, not the one I went for. And I have been outrageously pleased with it ever since. Mm. But the, the whole purchasing moment was made to feel um, glorious and special and, you know, not just something to be taken lightly. Mm -hmm. And it contrasts, doesn't it, with the way that we now buy so much of our stuff online, mm. that there is no experience that, that's comparable. And, um, you know, buying a book and just feeling the pages before you make the decision to oh, buy it is glorious, you know. But it's interesting because um, she's actually a great uh, salesperson because she sold you an experience. This is uh, this is why you bought yeah. that pen. <laughs> exactly. At, at first, I mean, it did a number of things. Maybe, maybe she didn't realize. Maybe she thought I wasn't serious and I was just going to go dribble, dribble, dribble. Thank you, goodbye. But by making me do that, she committed me to a purchase. But I was equally. Uh, I I tell a lot of people this story. It's it's about. The authenticity, the depth, the uh, attention to detail, uh, and the ease with which she extracted quite a lot of money from my wallet. <laughs> <laughs> but equally, you know, I've had that pen 10, 15 years. I still have the fountain pen, the Parker 75 that I did my O-levels with back in 1822. <laughs> Um, it was a good year for our levels it was a great year it was a great year. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I i it sits here you know it's, it's sitting on a rack it's sitting on a brass pencil rack that i found somewhere and i do use it twice a year just for fun and the nib is lovely but so so meanwhile back with the one i bought in london it, it just gives me joy mm. and i play with the colors of ink that i put into it <laughs> If it was 1822, you'd have been using a quill, probably, rather than... I a... would, I would, yes. Bring me another pheasant. <laughs> <laughs> I demand a fresh pheasant. Yes. This one has run out of tail feathers. <laughs> can, I just, can I just reduce things to absurdity like I like to do? Because when you talked about signing documents... I'm reminded of that there's, there's loads of books in bookshops about silly exam answers that kids have written over the years... And one of my favorites is um, where was the American Declaration of Independence signed? And one kid wrote at the bottom, which I thought was brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know whether he got a correct mark for that, for cheekiness, but uh, I, I like to think he did. I would have graded. I would have graded. Mine, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> the Oxford philosophy paper. What, what is courage? This is... <laughs> <laughs> this is yeah. In his final essay. <laughs> That's brilliant. Yeah. It, it's interesting uh, when we uh, talk about experience though and feeling something and having something tangible. I feel that like maybe when we are a little bit away from the physical, when we are away from actually going into a store and sitting down and having to buy things on Amazon or buy things online. One of the reasons I think stories are so powerful actually in business as well as away from business, is because they are the one thing I think you can use to create an experience, even if you can't actually be in the experience yourself. Because by telling stories, that's how you start to get those feelings of empathy, those feelings of um, feeling an experience you might have had once before, which you might not be having right at that moment, but is enough to trigger you to actually want to buy something because you are feeling like you are in the moment, you are feeling mm -hmm. like you are sitting down, um, writing with the pen, which is the perfect weight, the perfect weights now that you're in the right position. You can do that through a story. I had a desire to buy the pen 
that you bought Alistair just by you telling that story just now? Probably not quite as much of a desire as you, <laughs> but but I think that's what stories can do without having the necessary necessarily tangible aspect of buying something. That's mm. why I think they can be so powerful in business. Mm. I, I love the idea as well of a pen having a centre of gravity. Um, because with, with a golf club, just going back to my old sports, you, 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 if you imagine a long golf club there, you, you can hold it with on, under the shaft of the club and where it's in balance is where the swing weight of the club is. So you, you, you have a natural sort of centre of gravity along the length of the club, as well as the, you know, every club or bat or mallet or racket has a sweet spot as well. So, you know, when you hit it and you don't feel anything, it's wonderful. Um, and it's sadly a rather elusive place because we usually miss <laughs> the sweet spot but, very yeah, very, very with, uh, sorry Alistair it's the same with musical instruments because the bow of a cello or a violin has the same thing there's a there's a and it's not necessarily in the, in the middle point but there is mm. a balancing point that when you learn to play you, you one of the first things your teacher does is right hold your bow and find where that point is because yeah. for certain uh, notes that you're going to play you need to play at that point you need to get to set yourself up in the rhythm to get to that point so mm. that that balance goes it along across many things in life yeah yeah and you say there and it doesn't feel quite right if it's not mm. Mm. and business sometimes the deal doesn't feel quite right um we're not attuned we're not in balance and someone sent me a tweet this morning of how to do be successful at work. And it just was a big round thing with hard work. And then it moved on to another one, which was divided into um, sleep, good nutrition, rest, time off and hard work. And we were chatting, I was chatting with somebody earlier about getting balance in all those things that we do so that we are fit for purpose. And when we look in the mirror in the morning, and we go, oh, not another day. Look at you, you twisted old wreck, as I say to myself someday. <laughs> or I thought you were saying that to me then, uh, Alistair. That was very, 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 I was very quick. <laughs> just made sure that none of you felt targeted. Uh, and sometimes you think, okay, mate, coffee, caffeine, get going. Hit the plan, you know, hit, hit the strip with your roller skates or whatever it is and get, get into action. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So, Alistair, you were talking in our first Zoom call the other day, if anybody's not had a chance to watch that, uh, there, there is a replay available. Um, and you were talking about the idea of, imagine if we just said what we wanted to say, if we just said what we meant, if the thoughts just came out of our... No filter. No filter. And... Um, Sian and I yesterday, by coincidence, started watching a um, program on Prime called As We See It. Has anybody seen <laughs> As We See It at all? No. So the premise behind it, um, it focuses on three characters, three main characters, who all are somewhere on the autistic spectrum. Um, and one of the characters in particular one of the things that he finds hard to do is stop himself from saying what he truly believes. It's worth a watch. I won't give away any of the story. But what I love about it, and it really reminded me of, uh, of our conversation the other day, was that it can at first seem very prickly. It can at first seem rude. It can seem arrogant. But the more you get to know the character, the more it actually becomes charming and trusting. Because <laughs> when people say what they really think, you know when they're upset with you, but you also know when they say something that's a compliment and they're happy with you, <laughs> that, it's, <laughs> that it's true. So the reason I wanted to share that kind of mini story about the program was obviously because of what we talked about the other day, but just to see if we could develop that idea further, how, how about when we are talking to people, how much of a filter do we all put on? I think it's very, I, I heard a psychologist talking about this the other day and she talked about the difference between the message and the meta message. 
So a classic example in normal conversation would be, um, do you like your hair that length? <laughs> um, and you could answer yes, but that's not what they mean. They, they're disapproving of your new haircut, which is now either too short or too, whatever it happens to be. Um, you're watching your, the TV of an evening with your partner. <clears throat> and let's say she says, um, should we watch something else? Um, and you said, no, I, I'm happy with this. Or are you happy <laughs> watching this? Yes, I'm happy watching. That's not, no, <laughs> that's not what's meant. And I think sometimes... That's never happened between us. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it could be a straightforward question, but it's not straightforward because we haven't read the meaning behind the words and the words aren't mm. overtly stating the meaning. We have to find the nuance. I think we this is also exactly. particularly interesting across different cultures because um, something I learned when we moved to the Netherlands is people are very stereotypically, but quite generally true, they're much more straight talking. They're yeah. much more, they, they tell you what they think and it's a little bit of a shock at first. But I also had to adjust my way of speaking a little bit because in Ireland we are maybe a bit too polite and we don't quite ask for the thing that we actually want. We kind mm. of beat around the bush a bit. And at some point I realized that the person that I've just asked to do some work for me has no idea that I'm asking him to do the work because I didn't just ask. I kind of said, well, maybe if you have time, if it's not too much trouble, 10 That's different right. ways. <laughs> and he walked away thinking, yeah, I'm really busy. So I don't have time. And I walked away thinking that I'd asked him to do something. Yeah. Well, it is too much trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really, it's so relatable. Yeah. I also I live in the Netherlands. Uh, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Where uh, do you guys live, actually? Uh, which part of the Netherlands? In Eindhoven in the south. Do you know it? Where oh, did okay. you live? Uh, North Holland is ne near Amsterdam. I think it's even oh, okay, tougher nice. here. <laughs> Because they say, yeah, south of Holland is okay. People can be a little bit nicer, <laughs> but here's like yeah. you will have to you really get you have to be straightforward and yeah, to the point. Because mm. I, I read somewhere in a in a book about culture that there was a, a Dutch guy who had an English boss, and his boss said, "Why don't you have a think about doing this?" And uh, <laughs> he 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 had a think about it and decided not to do it. <laughs> <laughs> and got in and got in got fired i think for <laughs> wow. uh, <laughs> so oh, but i think it's not uh, not necessary i mean not always a cultural thing i think it um, goes back to the way you see yourself as a as a person uh, in a relationship, I think it uh, it comes down to to your attachment style. You know how much you, <laughs> uh, how you are connected to to the other person, and uh, how much you value their opinion, or how much you need to be validated in your opinion, and uh, you know. So yeah, it's uh, very nuanced. <laughs> mm. I mean, we do need to be encouraged somehow. I'm looking to go back, Julia, to have you met yourself. You know, there's some days, you know, you're thinking, oh, I was rejected yesterday by in a business deal or uh, something. Things didn't go really well. You think, oh, what's the point of all this? And yet when we endure and I, whatever we do next, and there are many things, when we reimagine, redefine, redesign or reconfigure um and we we say the story or to somebody else and we we are in validated your word validated uh, i've no I, I i don't know what the human condition is but we we need to think we're, we're providing purpose on the planet somehow um so having met yourself I, I will go and look at myself more closely in the mirror tomorrow morning <laughs> I think we might yeah. all be doing that. <laughs> so uh, let's uh, let's let's spark another conversation with another story. Who would like to read or share with us something? I think as an extension of "Have you met yourself?" I, I wrote something. It's kind of a bit of an extension of what I published on LinkedIn, and. 
it's called Mondays. <laughs> We've talked about Mondays and I bring it back. Uh, Mondays have always made me anxious. As a student, the scary face of maths assessments and results gave me shivers uh, as they would almost certainly fall on Mondays. When I grew up, I started working and then the anxiety increased because I always lived in a loop from Monday to Friday and only kind of existed on weekends. Will it always be, would it always be like this for the rest of my life? I wondered. Hence, as an affirmative answer, I used to panic. It seemed that Mondays were there to remind me of what I hadn't got done in the previous week. Unwanted advice, things I wouldn't know how to deal with, things already, I was already dealing with. But who was I outside this loop? When I started looking for work in the Netherlands, one of the things I learned was to define what my hobbies were. And then I was desperate because I didn't know what I liked anymore. <laughs> in fate of an always being ready for work available to others, I forgot that I liked writing. I forgot that I liked going for a walk, baking, singing under the shower, being me. And today, I try to actually relax on Sundays instead of mentally prepare myself for Mondays. Well, Mondays don't really have to be scary. It's a day like any other. It's the beginning of another week in which instead of living up to expectations, we have the opportunity to live and do our best. It's a day we take the planner and see what's in store for the week. But knowing what that surprises and unforeseen events almost always happen. It's the day to reflect that you can also laugh during the week and have that beer at the back of the fridge. In fact, I propose a toast to normalize Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, even as we continue to celebrate Fridays, and rightly so. I propose a toast to all the chaotic minds behind every Excel sheet or whatever digital planet they advertise nowadays on YouTube. Uh, a toast to the scary and a toast to the not so scary. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Cheers. Very good. That's a good toast. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I so had some more uh, water. Do we have anybody who... Sorry, Andrew, I missed that. I said I wish I had something more than water to toast. <laughs> I was thinking <laughs> too. <laughs> we should... Uh, I think the next, um, the, the next one of these... Zoom calls is on a, a Friday evening, so we, we, we could maybe bring something a little bit different on <laughs> to have a toast to that. <laughs> um, it is a really uh, thought-provoking um, story. Thank you. And it, it it's interesting because I, I, I definitely, again, it's another idea behind connection. Um, I, I imagine you're not the only person <laughs> in the world who has <laughs> dreaded Mondays. No, um, I, I, what... Who was the uh, what was the song? I don't like Mondays by Boomtown Rats, right? Tell me why I don't like Mondays. Uh, exactly, a great song. It is. I think it's about something completely different, to be honest. But um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but at the same time, I think uh, a lot of people, when they heard it, one of the reasons they connected with it is because they had no idea what it was about and thought, "God, I really hate having to get up on the Mondays," <laughs> um, and really dislike the, as you say, often there's. If you're in a work environment, I remember working in the corporate um, world, which feels like a long time ago now, but the big meeting of a week was always on a Monday morning. I never understood why you would have the big meeting of the week on a Monday morning, because you would look around you. And when I was awake enough to look at everybody else, everybody else was asleep. So <laughs> <laughs> it just didn't make any sense to me why you would, why you would start on a Monday morning. But these days, uh, my philosophy has changed a bit, possibly because I, uh, I, I run my own business and uh, every day is a, a working day, but every day is also a leisure day, depending on how I choose. Um, but I don't know about you guys. How do, you, uh, how do the rest of you all feel about Mondays? And do you agree to toast to, the, to a Monday and the rest of the week? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a really it's a really nice idea to, to suggest or, or that we redefine something 
that maybe has been perceived negatively, just decide to think differently about it. I think that's a powerful message. But I think when you're self-employed like I am and have been for a number of years, you see Monday as a as the start of a new week of opportunity. Yes. It was a great day, Monday. Hmm. Yes, because I, I live in I live in a world of lists. A pile of paper here, which sort of moves to there with three different colored fountain pens working on it in between. And um, yes, sometimes you start off on Monday hoping to get to the end of the list by Friday. And sometimes by Friday you go, what? I have achieved almost nothing or, you know, other stuff comes in from the internet of things just to get in your way. Um, I think that's all I have to say about Monday. Lists. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, sometimes moving your pile of papers from there to there, Alistair, I mean, that's an achievement, surely, if you, you've done something. Well, as, as, as uh, Stefano knows, I, my days are strangely different. And so I, you know, I'm looking at music songs and poetry and how that fits into the world of health or engineering and so mm -hmm. forth and uh, get my students to write poems and engineering and I, I just I, I, I bet I tripped over a book by Pushkin this morning but which reminded me of Eugenie Onegin and I just want to go to chapter seven uh, if it's where is it because it's, it's, it's there's a couple of chapter seven hello chapter seven um, there was a wonderful little line in it worth reading. Yes, uh, it's, a, it's, it's early in the book. He lacked passion. And it's, the entire book, Eugenie uh, Onegin, is written uh, as a poem. It's an unusual way of writing the, an entire book. Um, he lacked the passion and desire to give his life for poetry, despite all efforts, or aspire to tell... He, uh, Iambic from, I don't know, Trochi, Trochi, bored by Theocritus and Homer. Adam Smith was more his, his tome where, deep in all things economic, the Welsh of nations was his topic. On what the state relies, he told of how it lives and what and why, with staple products its supply, no need to keep reserves of gold, full stop. And to write an entire book that makes political and social meaning in verse is something. But I just liked that whole, and so I quote the economics bits to engineering students to show them that engineering, poetry, and business all have combined meaning, and two of them get it. <laughs> <laughs> two of them, out of hand. Oh, thousands. <laughs> We're talking engineers, and as I know, you know, engineers are, many of them don't like poetry. <laughs> but the ones at Phillips love it. <laughs> they they just they just don't understand it, yeah, Alistair. That's all. They on just Monday don't understand morning, what they, they like. Say, on Monday mornings, they say hi. Let's really reimagine this MRI. <laughs> <laughs> and there is a saying, isn't there? How, how do you recognise an extroverted engineer? And it's that their eyes aren't looking at their own shoes; they're looking at your shoes. <laughs> Well, I have a little conundrum. I have a little conundrum for for you tonight. It's it's a book called Twenty Six Treasures, and it's probably not available. It was printed by Unbound, so I still have nine hundred ninety six copies sitting here. Um, <laughs> not quite. I was asked. I got a call from a super girl in Belfast who said, "Alistair, are you free for lunch tomorrow?" I said, "What I should have said was." You've never asked me out to lunch before. What's up? If I'd wanted to tell the truth. But I said, sure, that would be wonderful. Meaning, gosh, I must go and see what this is all about. So we sat down and we chatted away. And she said, ordered our chicken sandwich. And she said to me, have you heard of the 26 Club? I go, oh, no. What is that? I ask you, have you heard of the 26 Club? Any of you? Andrew probably had, but apparently it's a, it's a it's a club that consists of the top poets in Britain, and includes the poet laureate. And every year, the twenty the twenty six poets are identified and invited to write 
a poem of 62 words. So you take the 26 poets, because there are 26 letters in the alphabet, and they have to write a poem of 62 words, and off they go. And I said, gosh, that's very interesting. So Gillian said to me, I've been asked to uh, create a 26 club of poets for, in Ireland, and I've found 25. Would you be number 26? And I said, is that because there are only 25 poets in Ireland and I'm the only other guy you know? <laughs> and she said, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> so what happened was the 26 of us were taken to the, uh, the Ulster Museum in Belfast, which is the equivalent of probably of the V&A in London. And we were twinned with an ancient um, artifact in the museum. And it was totally at random. So I was twinned with uh, two horns, bronze horns that were about 3,000 years old. And I was sent away for a couple of weeks to write 62 words about these bronze horns. Now, I wasn't allowed to take them home with me. So I spent some time clutching, clutching the armoured glass case that they were in, going, um bronze horns <laughs> and, and I went away and I wrote 26 words I was also twinned with a local design company and they had to create a poster about the bronze horns and then we all came back and had a fun evening in the museum and I mean they it was so the 20s I just thought it was absolutely wonderful oddly I knew I knew one or two of the poems uh, poets and then they did the same thing in Wales and Scotland and they produced this book which has got um, 26 times 4 what's that 104 poems in it and 104 artifacts brought together to form our little anthology and so I'm going to read you my little piece which with hindsight you know it's it when I set out to write it, I had no idea where I was going with it as, I, as we started. But I thought about these bronze horns and I thought to myself, what, did, what were they used for? What did they do? Why did they have them? What would we use now? Well, now, of course, we would all have a smartphone and somebody would send you an SMS message. So I took the view that uh, these horns were the communication device for the community, because that's all they had. So here's a, here's a little poem. It's, the poem is called Breaking News. Born to deliver sound, all tones and moods, joy, sorrow, warnings and news, news of birth, death, war, harvest, Rain, hope, despair. Trumpeting, trumpeting my master's bidding. Bor born on the wind, I share my news with all who listen. I command you, listen and respond. Reverberating with joy. Sonorously and gloomily, I weep for the fallen. Listen to me. Simply listen. Uh, so, I mean, I'm not an international poet, but I th it was a challenge. And it was, one, very nice to be asked. Two, to go into this strange space of art and artefacts going, what will I be handed? No choice. And told to go away and do something about it because you're going to be in print. And then someone else is going to uh, create a picture of these bronze horns in some form. Uh, and 25 other people are doing a similar thing. And I thought it was a nice exercise in something. I don't know what you guys would call that. Creative. But it certainly Creative. Stretched, it stretched me. Mm. I think create, creativity, creative... Um... 
it's an exercise in expressing and digging into your creative boundaries i guess i guess um a little bit of a, a little bit of promotion actually here i'm going to steal your amazing poem <laughs> and uh, the story you just told um because there is an opportunity for all of you and anybody else who is uh, watching uh, tomorrow um at 2 p.m uk time to um embrace and to dig into your own creativity because a friend of um, ours, uh, Darren from Ipso Dexo, is um, going to be putting on a workshop, which is a flash fiction workshop. And the opportunity that's there is to spend 15 minutes with a couple of other people in your group um, to explore a range of different prompts to create a story, but the prompts are selected completely at random. So a little bit like you finding your horns in the <laughs> museum, uh, the genre that you write in and the elements that you add to the story are not your choice, but you use those boundaries to create something hopefully rather special or even completely nonsensical. It doesn't actually matter that much. The idea is just that you are learning to express yourself and learning, I guess, to let go a bit, which is maybe what they were asking you to do with your poetry as well, to use a boundary to help you let go. That sounds like a strange thing, but sometimes I find it helps. And Can anybody be joining us? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I you know, all of this makes me come back to engineering and industry and commerce. But, you know, you, you take a lot of engineers or software writers. Um, now, if they're gamers, they probably can let themselves go. Uh, <laughs> but they... I wonder, you know, what, what do you guys think is the value of saying to some of your employees or the people that you mentor in business uh, to do something completely different outside the business plan? What is... I believe that sort of stuff has value. What What do you guys think? Yes, I 100% agree, nice. but other people pitch in. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, what do I mean? How do you, what we're doing here tonight, how do you think that feeds back into commerce and boring in businesses where finance guys are saying, you know, every three months we need to grow? One of the closest things I've, I've heard with this, it's an experiment I think they do, or a workshop they do at Harvard Business School is they get a load of executives together and they have to focus on um, you know, one particular business and discuss all of the things that could, they could do that would make that business collapse. Huh. So in a way, what that's doing is it's making them see the opposite of the things that maybe they should be doing that aren't that, <laughs> that gives them a steer in the direction they should be going in. So that's almost like a little creative approach to strategic you know, planning and decision making. Um, and in, in my own world of, you know, applied storytelling, most of my clients happen to be technically trained professionals who uh, struggle with the idea of humanizing and storifying content, which they find, you know, they, they're comfortable delivering very dry content. Wow. And I'm always trying to move them along the spectrum a little bit to humanize and storify what would otherwise be very dry, you know, sort of, um structural abstract language that they're using so um I, I mean i'm just sort of rambling here but i'm just trying to think of ways in which you know my engineering people or the equivalent would be embracing some kind of creative process or wishing they could embrace it but it doesn't come naturally to them and when me, they, i think you, there's sorry go on and stop <laughs> And if you can, or when you persuade them to embrace it, or at least try it, mm. does that empower them or, or, I mean, build them up a little bit at least or a whole lot? Or do well, they what, what's really, I, I got a very interesting piece of feedback the other day. It was, a, I'd done a workshop for a PwC, you know, Price Waterhouse. Um, and one of the ladies who attended the workshop wrote to me or she sent me an email 9 30 of an evening it came in i remember it distinctly this was about maybe a month ago 
saying, and I attended your workshop and I just wanted to tell you something that happened to me recently. And she said, I had to give a talk or a speech at my daughter's christening and baptism. And um, I was going to approach it in the conventional way of, you know, thank you, everybody, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. Uh, but she ditched that completely and decided to tell the story of how this little girl came into the world. And she wrote to me, she said, and my hands were shaking like a leaf. I was sweating my heart. I thought I was having a heart attack. But, but the response from the audience was amazing. And I just wanted to thank you. And it's something I'm determined to continue applying in the workplace as well. So although the, the workshop was aimed at helping them in the workplace, the first thing she found an impact with was outside work in her personal world. And I, I really get a kick when I hear that, because a lot of the time I think you're delivering workshops where people want a, a return on their investment. How is this going to make me sell more? How is this going to help me with my pitch that I've got to give next week or my interview I've got coming up? But it's lovely when people find a, a benefit that's broader than that in the sense that it's opened their eyes to the joy in the world or they're starting to value things in relationships that they didn't see before. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank, uh, thank you for that because, yeah, you, it, it, at undergraduate level in universities uh, and uh, it's all about the business model canvas and design thinking. But when you're 35 years of age and your share price has gone up and down and up and down and the world's in tatters, uh, the business model canvas ain't going to fix it. Mm. Something far more is needed. Yeah. And it's this huge blend of some of different things. Mm. How about uh, uh, Yulia and uh, Livra? What are, what, are your, what are your thoughts on bringing in external ideas into corporate world and bringing in the ideas, I guess, of almost emotional connection, I think is what Alistair and Andrew are talking about there to a degree by using stories, by using outer experiences to people who often from an outside perspective might seem a little bit void of emotion, but clearly are not, <laughs> but, <laughs> or, or often want to separate something external to what they do within their working life. Do, do you think there's a power in, I guess, breaking the mold, breaking out, asking different questions at all? Yes, definitely. I mean, I work with content marketing myself. So I think storytelling and content marketing are pretty much aligned. So uh, we are to point that we can actually separate both of them. No one wants to hear uh, or read any content if it's not telling a story or background story about their brands or the product they're selling and the pitch uh, they used to place on i mean not social media but in the 80s for example or in the 90s or beginning of the thousands uh, about a product and why uh, people would have to buy them uh, this kind of this uh, speech doesn't work anymore so i mean if you're a brand uh, in whatever uh, market and if you don't know how to tell your story i mean i think you're really uh, losing it and i think stories are a perfect uh, way to connect to your public, to your audience, and uh, to share uh, more relatability, to let the world know that you are also all, uh, also human, just like them. Mm. And you're not there only to sell your product, to sell your services, but you want to make that community work. And so you can work together. Mm. Yeah, I like that idea. And and how about even if we're going away from something I find intriguing, actually, if you if you, if you go into a lot of corporate offices, uh, not just engineering offices, but a lot of the places I used to work um, in different, uh, I used to work with IT sales and and even actually I used to work um, in, in the radio industry, but often with people who were not externally facing, who do not speak to customers ever. One of the things I often found interesting is that their goals, the people who were not speaking to customers externally, the people who were not writing content, the people who were not creating a radio ad, who were not selling, who were not marketing, 
were completely different. So um, a, a, an IT sales uh, person who was maybe a technician, would their goal would be, well, I need to fix 50 computers this week, or I need to uh, make sure that the server is running as fast as possible. And so sometimes then when you go in and you say, well, let's have a look at this from a different perspective. Let's go outside of the box. Let's look at a story. Let's look at um, an activity day or something like that. It just seems far-fetched. How is it going to help them to fix 50 computers? And so sometimes I, I, I believe that there are there is power still with, with those employees as well in being able to connect to them and get them to think differently because they can also think differently about how they might fix the computers or what their goal is, what's the depth behind fixing the computers, why are they doing it in the first place, for example. So I don't know if this relates to what you're talking about, Alistair, but that to me is kind of where I see there is a possibility if we can get it right in taking people, even who have no external facing role, who aren't speaking to customers, but taking them out of the idea of what they think maybe their job is to getting them to realize, well, why they're doing it in the first place. And I think taking them outside of their parameters helps mm -hmm. with that. It, it, does that relate at all to, to what you're talking about or am I missing the, am I missing the point? <laughs> no, definitely not. Uh, very much aligns to what I, uh, I'd like to propagate. I mean, with my uh, stories, what I post, what I, I've been posting on Instagram myself as well. And it's like, taking this perspective to another level I mean looking who you are again once more who am I and what I'm doing and just like uh, trying to exist for at least a couple of minutes and just reaccess what are you doing why and for whom in mm. this chaotic world uh, where everywhere everyone and everything has to be so fast so I think it's still a challenge but I mean if we can get it working I mean little by little I think mm. I think the, the, the I think the challenge always is to is to try to connect what that person's role is with the mm -hmm. impact that their role has maybe to the end user to the to the yes. human beings who are affected yes. by what they're doing. Now, Alistair, I'm going to mention a very old TV program, and probably you and I are the only people who will remember this. But it's not the <laughs> nine o'clock news. <laughs> and not the nine o'clock news was one of the very first things that Rowan Atkinson appeared in. Oh. And I remember one particular sketch where they showed a guy in an office and all he had to do was turn a handle like this. That's all he did. He would turn the handle and he looked really, really bored because this is all he did all day. And then it cut to a uh, following where this handle went, the mechanism, the internal mechanism. It went through walls and through different floors of the building. It went all the way through this particular building. And then it cut to New Scotland Yard because the sign outside New Scotland Yard just revolves like this all the time. <laughs> well, it was a lovely gag, but it, it just came to my mind because this is the, the end user element. You know, you can be deep in the machinery of, of an organization and forget the, you know, the impact of your work down the line. And that, that sort of image it just came into my head for some reason. Yes, that's perfect. I, well, I will be going back and looking at some, not the nine o'clock news, under last Smith and Jones. Yes. Because uh, I, I could see the two of us doing, you know that one where they're head to head facing each oh, other? Oh, yes. Yeah. They're two face to face. Yeah. Yeah. So it's Monday yeah, morning. Let's, what are you going to do? do? Well, we'll have to turn that way. Yes. We'll, we'll have to. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning again. <laughs> Have you looked in the mirror today? <laughs> I, I'm going to tell you one quick story, then I have to go. But there's the story of I'm very interested in how to make hospitals. Look, really you're side by side right now. <laughs> you can do that bit. <laughs> I, I, thought I, would, I thought I would set you up. Yeah. <laughs> no, the other way. Around. Alistair, face the other way. Alistair, the other way. The other way. The other way. <laughs> So tell, tell, tell me more about this. <laughs> I've got a story for you. <laughs> <laughs> there's a guy, there's a guy in a hospital who has been subcontracted by the catering, by the by the lowest quote from the from the catering company with the lowest quote to mop the floors. And he's not from around here. He's on minimum wage. And he is revered by no one. So he's mopping the floor 
<laughs> he's turning the handle. <laughs> <laughs> and he's bored. And people just walk past him. No one knows his name. Nobody cares. Anyway, so some, but I stops him and says, what are you doing? He says, I'm, I'm mopping the floor. Why are you mopping the floor? To keep it clean. Oh, why are you keeping it clean? To keep rid of bacteria. And, and what happens when we reduce bacteria? Well, we reduce the number of germs. And what happens then? Well, maybe people get better faster. Yes. And what would that mean? Well, it means they wouldn't stay so long in hospital. That's right. So what would happen then? Well, they'd go home to their families and, they'd, and their morale would go up. Yes. And we'd be able to treat more patients. Yes. Um, all because you're doing what? Because I'm mopping the floor. Mm. <laughs> so by mopping the floor more thoroughly, you are actually improving the health of the nation. Mm. But of course, nobody tells them that. They yeah. probably say, you're lucky to have this job. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and don't dare be late. Mm. Whereas when we can give people meaning, why am I doing this? Uh, am I creating meaning? Then everyone has a role to play. Mm. So, I'm going to leave you with that. But, and can I just say, it's lovely to see you all again tonight. Uh, uh, from last night, uh, the, uh, uh, Andrew, to see you from last year. And hey, listen, I'd love to have a conversation with you uh, about Monday mornings on Smith and Jones, etc. <laughs> I've got to go. Lovely to see you all. Thanks for, for, for tonight. Great to see you. Great Great to see you up with the others. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Before we, before we say goodbye to everybody, because I think uh, it's, it's getting close to that time, um, Andrew, I know that you had a, a story that you had ready to share with us. Um, is, uh, is it still ready or is it, um, has it already well, come it, out of the oven? It, it, it is. It's, it's not a, a short story, but I'll, I'll try and condense it because you, you, you need to, people need to go. Um, so I, I don't know if any of you have ever found yourself listening to the radio when there's a quiz show on. And you know the answer to some of the questions and the contestant on the show doesn't know anything. Oh, for God's sake, that's really easy. So this story really is about being on the other side and how difficult it is to be on the other side. Because I was on a TV quiz show once and it was the worst experience of my life. And um, I, well, it wasn't, but it wasn't, wasn't a good experience. I used to work for the Professional Golfers Association, the PGA and in the UK, the PGA have a couple of bodies. There's one in the Midlands, which is the Club Professionals PGA. It's like a membership organization. People who don't, they're not on the tour. They just sort of work at local golf clubs. And then there's the, 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 the glamorous people in London, uh, the PGA European Tour, the ones who you see on the TV all the time, Rory McIlroy and people like that. Um, and the two bodies were at loggerheads. There was tension between them back in the 1980s. And I worked for the one in the Midlands, the smaller one, but we were, we'd fallen out with the ones in London for reasons which I won't go into now. It was to do with money in the Ryder mm. Cup. So we had the bright idea as golf club, as sorry, golf referees, because I used to be a rules official for the PGA, to appear on a TV show called Busman's Holiday. And this, this show doesn't air anymore. This is years ago. But Busman's Holiday was basically three teams of three, each of whom represent a profession. So we went on as golf referees in our blazers and feeling very uh, you know pleased with ourselves. And we're, we've all been to university. We're all very bright people. And we were a little bit arrogant. And we were up against a pair of or a team of debt collectors from British Gas and a team of herbalists. And it was recorded in Granada TV studios in Manchester. And we bombed, absolutely <laughs> bombed. Um, we had to bring on a, um, a prop or an object associated with our profession. So I think the debt collectors brought on a nasty letter. Um, the herbalists brought on some herb. And we brought on the Ryder Cup. So we thought, wow, no, we're here. We're, we're, we're ahead of the game. We felt very good about ourselves until the questions started coming our way. 
And I remember the producer of the show told us beforehand, whatever happens, Andrew, just keep smiling. As long as you smile, that's all that matters. So I, I must have had this inane grin on my face all the way through as I got <laughs> question after question after question. And when it came down to the 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 one-to-one -one questions where only you could answer, you couldn't confer with your colleagues, I was asked this question, which I'll never forget to this day. This is 1988 this happened. And the question was this. The weight of a golf ball is 1.62 ounces. And it was ounces in those days. At what temperature is the test carried out in the laboratory to determine whether the golf ball conforms to this regulation? At which point my mind went blank. It went to complete mush like mashed potatoes. And I immediately thought to myself, well, this is unfair because that, that's not a rule of golf, but it's actually in the rule book. It's at the back of the rule book because when you produce a piece of golf equipment, you've got to send it in to be tested to make sure it's legal and doesn't have sort of radar controlled assistance to make your golf ball fly straight. So I was um, basically, well, we call it shafted in the UK. In other words, we, <laughs> we were done over by the PGA European Tour in London, because it turned out that they set our questions. <laughs> so, so they set me up. <laughs> and it was the most embarrassing um, experience because we were representing our profession. It's like you going on to a, a storytelling quiz show and getting all the questions about storytelling wrong. No, it's not good for the brand. I'm not going to allow you to set the questions if I go into a storytelling <laughs> question at all. And then so the, the next day, right, the two others in my team had to go back to the office and face the music. And I actually had to fly to America to do uh, some event over there. And I don't know which was worse because I had an eight hour flight to reflect on what had just happened. <laughs> And to this day, I have never seen that show broadcast on TV because I'm too ashamed to, to seek it out on YouTube. I have to say I'm not, so I will find that. <laughs> <laughs> but if, if, I were to find, link. <laughs> if I were to find a meaning or a moral somewhere, it, it, I, maybe it's about, you know, having some understanding of what it's like in someone else's shoes because when we are in the car and we're not under any pressure and we happen to listen to the radio and people are struggling to answer a question that we know the answer to, have a thought for how difficult it is to have the TV cameras on you in a studio with a live audience and your mind going blank. I, I think that's a, a, a beautiful way, actually, to uh, uh, to, to, to leave uh, to leave the uh, the evening. Everybody who is watching and everybody who has uh, uh, joined us today, have a think about what it might be like in other people's shoes. I really like that. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's, a, it's a great story. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, also, thank you to all of you for joining us today. Thank you to everyone who's um, who has been watching. A um, couple of points of order before we go. Um, sound like uh, I'm doing some kind of law conference. Um, as <laughs> mentioned earlier we uh, have the flash fiction tomorrow at 2 p.m uk time the workshop on friday at can you remember the time i think it's 6 p.m <laughs> but double check please um, i think it's friday at 6 p.m uh no it is friday at 4 p.m. 4 p.m. Yeah. Just ignore all of that. Have a look online. On Friday evening, we have a uh, another story session like today, and on Sunday evening, we will have a final um, uh, goodbye Zoom. So, if any of you can make that, that would be absolutely fantastic. We would uh, we would love to see you all there. Um, we will say goodbye, but as always, um, this time it's going to be Cyan. We will leave you with one final short story. Thank you so much for joining us today. So this is a story from Shelley Wilson. Sometimes we compare ourselves to the big stars or corporate giants, which can make us feel a bit overwhelmed or downhearted at times. I wanted to share this true event because not all of us know who the big names are or care. To explain this better, I'm using a story from my time living in America in 1994. We had just finished working for three months at a family camp 
in the Catskill Mountains and had been unleashed on New York City before we all went our separate ways. Always one to accept an invitation for pizza, I went along with a group of my new international friends to grab something to eat at a diner. There was a bit of a buzz from the customers around us, but we ignored it as we tucked into our pizza slices. Suddenly, we were bathed in lights and a camera crew began filming us. A well-dressed chap chatted to us, each of us in turn, asking us which country we were from and even checking our passports. He was pleasant enough and seemed excited to have stumbled across our group of English, Polish, Spanish, South African, Australia, German and Italian travellers. The cameras rolled, he chatted with us easily as they continued to film, and then he went on his merry way. As we finished off our pizza, slightly bewildered by the experience, I turned to my friends and said, who was that? The locals in the diner rushed over to us saying, we must be so excited y'all because we continued to look at them blankly. You've just been on the David Letterman show. Who? <laughs> Let's just say we finished our pizza quickly and left the diner under the scrutiny of every American patron. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Have a good